I want to start with a, a quick introduction of Iceland, just so you get a better sense of this country, its history, its people. Then I'm going to talk about some travel skills, practical skills for traveling around Iceland. And then I'm going to be getting into some specific destinations. So that's kind of where we're going to be going on this journey through Iceland. First of all, where is Iceland? Well, it's sort of partway between Europe and the United States and Canada. Uh, and that's the reason probably why you're here, because Iceland Air, which is based in Reykjavik, has really good deals for traveling to Europe. Their hub, of course, is Reykjavik. So if you're taking Iceland Air anywhere in Europe, you're going to pass through Reykjavik. And they have a very clever marketing plan where if you want to stay for a few days in Iceland, up to a few days, they don't charge you extra for the airfare. Um, so for that reason, you can kind of get a bonus free vacation on your way over to Europe or on your way back home from Europe. Um, and I think that's a big part of the reason why Iceland's so popular these days. They've made it really easy to do so. Let's talk a little more about sort of the geography and the placement of Iceland. It's at the very far north end of the North Atlantic, about halfway between Norway and Greenland. You'll notice it's just south of the Arctic Circle. The mainland of Iceland is not in the Arctic Circle, but a few offshore islands to the north are uh, technically across the Arctic Circle. Very remote, very rugged, small country. It's about the size of the state of Maine in the United States. It only has about 340,000 people. So the whole population of Iceland is about like Corpus Christi, Texas. It's about like Anaheim, California. Uh, it's about like Honolulu, just to give you a sense for the whole country. Uh, so this is a very, very uh, remote and very sparsely populated country. Uh, but given that, it's got a very rich culture and history that's fun to explore. Uh, when Rick Steves goes to Iceland with his Norwegian ancestry, he finds that he has these distant cousins all over the place. <laughs> and that's because most of the people who live in Iceland today are descended from early Scandinavians, uh, or you could think of the Old Norse culture, uh, the Viking Age. The people who settled Iceland weren't Vikings because they weren't pillaging and raping and marauding. They were the cousins of the Vikings who instead wanted to settle and create civilizations, right? Uh, these are the folks that we're talking about. Around the ninth century, the first Viking Age explorers from what is today Norway found their way across the North Atlantic and decided to start building scattered farms around Iceland. When they got to Iceland, they discovered a basically uninhabited country, which is interesting. Most of the stories of Europeans coming to the New World involve colonization and dealing with native populations. There was no, no one living in Iceland at that point, so they just built the country from scratch. Uh, there were also a few uh, Celtic people. People from Ireland are also part of the, of the Icelandic mix. But the dominant culture was Scandinavian. It was a very sparsely populated country and still is today. But for literally hundreds of years from the settlement age, Iceland was basically a series of uh, distantly located scattered farms. There'd be a farm here and then 50 miles away another farm. It was never really any city or town in Iceland until pretty much the 19th century. Um, so there was a very... Uh, pioneer kind of a mentality that still shapes some of what goes on in Iceland today. Uh, for reasons no one's quite sure of, though, Icelanders were very literate, and they were great writers and great chroniclers. So a lot of the, what we know about the history of the early Scandinavians actually came from the Icelanders. You can actually read contemporary English translations of what's called the sagas, the sagas of the Icelanders. And these are sort of the uh, partial fact and par partial myth of the early stories of Scandinavia uh, and of Iceland specifically, kind of like the Robin Hood or King Arthur type tales, um, and also some historically documented chronicles of the people who first settled Iceland. Um, so there's actually a really rich literary tradition in Iceland, uh, despite how sparsely populated it was. Uh, but again, the Icelanders kind of toiled on through the centuries in this remote little outpost, kind of the, the poor country backward uh, backwater of uh, the Scandinavians. Um, there were really no cities or towns. It was part of Norway for a few hundred years, and then it became part of Denmark for a few hundred years, but it was always kind of an afterthought. And then in the middle of the 19th century, about when there were a lot of independence movements going across Europe, it happened in Iceland as well. And they said, you know what? We don't want to have to go to university in Copenhagen uh, just because we're from Iceland, which was the only option at that time. We want our own universities. We want to be considered our own culture, our own entity. It was a gradual process, but in 1943, finally, officially, Iceland became an independent country. Um, that gives you a sense of how young Iceland is as an independent country. Around that same time, uh, World War II was going on, and the United States, the Allies, technically occupied Iceland. Uh, they weren't invited there, but they said, you know, we need a base partway to Europe. And they built a giant airport there uh, called Kefavlik, which is still the international airport that you will arrive at when you go to Iceland today. It was built by the US military, and that's part of the reason People go to Iceland because there's this big military airport that's perfect for Iceland Air 747s uh, and makes it viable as a stopover place for all of these transcontinental flights. 
you've heard a lot about Iceland probably in recent years. All of a sudden, it's in the news everywhere. 2008, the global financial crisis, you might know, racked Iceland particularly hard. It just sent their currency, the krona, plummeting. Uh, it was a really tough time in Iceland. They had done a lot of very unwise uh, speculating. A lot of the kinds of investment that got us into trouble in the United States were done sort of with a vengeance in Iceland. Uh, but it's been really remarkable to see how well things have bounced back. Uh, the place is really in recovery, more than in recovery. It's doing great, which I think speaks to something about the Icelandic character. Uh, Icelanders are very can-do people. They're sort of the Scandinavian nose-to-the-grindstone work ethic type people. Uh, but also, they have this pioneer mentality. You have to make it work, right? They live in this really rugged, remote place where they just have to look out for themselves, and they figure out a, make, a way to make it work. The other reason why you might have heard about Iceland recently is it's incredibly popular with tourists these days. If you want to know what exponential looks like, this is what exponential looks like. This is visits of Americans to Iceland starting in 2003. And around 2010, you can see it just spikes like crazy. In 2016, more Americans visited Iceland than the people who live in Iceland. Wow. Yeah, and that's probably why you're watching this class right now. Uh, for good reason, it's a great place to visit. I, I also think this is, though, a good reminder that this is a place that's kind of grappling with this sudden, very dramatic popularity. I'm amazed at how well they're handling it. Again, this is sort of the spirit of the Icelander, the pioneer spirit, we're going to make this work. Working on our guidebook, I drive around in the countryside, and I come to some farmhouse B&B, &B, and I go in and I say, oh, I see you have five rooms in your brochures. They say, well, we, ha we had five rooms. We're building 10 more in a new building across the street. <laughs> This is how Icelanders operate. They're just saying, you know, roll up your sleeves and let's make the most of it and let's take care of these tourists. And so I, I would say um, be thoughtful and respectful of the fact that they're dealing with sort of this whole new culture of tourism, but they're handling it very well is the good news. I find Icelanders, by the way, just delightful. I really enjoy spending time with them. Um, most Icelanders in the tourist trade speak great English. Um, they've got a, a great personality. Um, I would say this is one of the treats of going to Iceland. And if you're going to Iceland, it would be really easy to go for a few days and never really talk to an Icelander because there's so much tourism and a lot of it's concentrated in a few places. So I would challenge you to actually get out and try to meet a few Icelandic people and learn a little bit about what it's like to live in this unique part of the world. They have a lifestyle there that uh, there's really nothing like it anywhere else and a landscape as well. Uh, a few things that might help you in getting used to Iceland. They have basically the same alphabet we do, but they have some different letters. And I will be honest, Icelandic is difficult to pronounce. Um, there's very long words. They have a way of stacking up words to create much longer words. Um, it's a Scandinavian language, OK? So if you are familiar or have heard Norwegian or Swedish or Danish, some of it might be a little bit familiar. Um, but for someone visiting for a couple of days, it can be a little overwhelming. Again, not too much of a language barrier. But if you want to try to sound things out, I'm going to give you a few clues, the key things that are big differences that most likely trip up a tourist. The first one are these two letters. Okay, These both are letters that would be translated as a TH in English. The first one is called a thorn. It looks like a P with a little stick coming off the top. That would be an unvoiced TH sound, like the word breath. So it's a, a, just a simple th sound. This is uh, called the EV, and it's a D with a little cross on it. And that's a voiced TH sound, like the, like breathe. So this is breath, and this is breathe if that makes sense. Uh, to help you get your head around this, let's talk about a couple of sort of Icelandic figures that you're probably familiar with. I mentioned that the Icelanders were part of the Old Norse tradition. Does anyone know who the Old Norse god of thunder was? Thor. Thor, right? Thor. We call him Thor in English. The Icelanders also call him Thor. Thor. That's that letter, the thorn. It looks like a P, but it's pronounced like a TH, a soft, an unvoiced TH, Thor. Does anyone know who Thor's father is? Odin. Odin, OK, whom Icelanders call Odin. Odin. That's the D with the cross, which is a voiced TH sound. Thor, th, 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 Odin, the, the, the. These are probably the letters that most trip up tourists. A couple other letters to be aware of in terms of pronunciation. And by the way, I could do a whole class just on pronouncing Icelandic. Um, but the other two, I think, that are the most confusing like in a lot of European languages, a J is pronounced like a Y. That's pretty common, especially Scandinavian or German languages. A double L is surprising. It has kind of a TL sound. If you're familiar with Welsh, spoken in the United Kingdom, spoken in Wales, they have a very similar sound. A double L is a TL sound, a TL, TL sound. As I go through the talk, I'll point out situations where these occur and give you a chance to sort of hear what they sound like. And let me say, 
I am far from an expert at pronouncing Icelandic. Um, I'm just learning myself, but uh, I think sometimes it helps to kind of get your ears around hearing a non-native speaker say some of these words so you can start to train your brain for what you're supposed to do. Let's talk about another famous uh, Icelander, maybe the most famous Icelander, Björk, international pop star, idiosyncratic fashionista, uh, and proud Icelander. There's that J, this, the J that sounds like a, a Y, Björk. Icelandic has the umlaut over the O, just like in German. So if you're familiar with German, that's the same letter. You might not know this, but Björk's last name is Guthmundsdottir. Guthmundsdottir, that's the TH sound, that's a, a voice TH. Guthmund's daughter, that's an interesting word. What's interesting about the way Icelanders form their names is their patronyms. They're not hereditary. In other words, you form your name using your father or sometimes your mother's first name, followed by son or daughter. So Björk's last name, last name or surname, is Björk, daughter of Guthmund's, Guthmund's daughter. Okay, this is the same, not for all Icelanders, but for most Icelanders, they still follow this tradition. The other interesting thing about Icelandic names is Icelanders are all on a first name basis. It's probably partly because they don't have these hereditary last names that follow them through generations. So the last name is a little less important. If you run into the uh, president on the streets of Reykjavik, you would say, well, hello, Bjarni. You wouldn't say, oh, hello, Mr. President. Uh, to us, that seems kind of informal, but that's just the way Icelanders do it. Uh, actually, uh, using someone's full first name is considered very formal. Everyone has a nickname that only their friends can use. So that these are sort of these interesting little characteristics of Icelandic culture. The Icelandic currency is the kroner, which is similar to the currency in other Scandinavian countries, Norway and Sweden. In the case of Iceland, it's about 100 kroner to the dollar, and that makes it pretty easy to convert things in your mind. You just sort of chop off two zeros at the end, very roughly. It fluctuates, but that's the general idea. Uh, but by the way, you probably are rarely going to see actual cash kroner because Iceland is very much a credit card-based economy. You will pay for everything with a credit card. You will pay for a pack of gum at a convenience store with a credit card. Uh, you will sometimes pay for using the bathroom with a credit card. You could very easily spend several days in Iceland and never actually get out any local cash, and you'll probably be OK. I think it's a good idea just to get out maybe $10, $15, 20 worth of Icelandic cash when you arrive, just so you have it for the rare cases where you need it, which would be situations like paying for a bathroom at a place that doesn't take credit cards. Um, it's also helpful to know that Icelanders don't tip. So if you're going to a restaurant, tipping is never part of their custom there. You never have to tip at all, which is another reason why you don't need to be carrying around a lot of cash. Now, uh, this is fortunate because Iceland is very expensive. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But the, probably the main thing I would say as a warning, if there's any downside to traveling to Iceland, it's a little bit cold, but also it's very expensive. So you just need to be prepared for that. Before I move on from this topic, though, I wanted to point out uh, Icelanders use the chip and pin system, and more and more Americans are comfortable with this. But occasionally, American chip and pin cards don't work in Icelandic pay points. I didn't have this occur to me very often in Iceland. Where it's most likely to happen would be like an automated, uh, automated gas station. Uh, the only way that you can avoid this is don't let your gas tank get too low. If you're in the middle of the countryside, you don't want to wait too long to get gas in case the one gas station for 20 miles doesn't take your kind of credit card. Um, other than that, I think there's not too many situations where this would trip you up. Most of the time, your credit card will, will, will work fine. So let's talk a little more about this very expensive aspect of going to Iceland. Compared to uh, even the most expensive parts of Europe, I'm thinking places like Norway, uh, maybe even Switzerland, Iceland is really at the top of that scale. So a simple, not simple, but a straightforward business class hotel room in downtown Reykjavik is going to be about $300, $250, $300, something you might expect to pay $150, $200 for in most of Europe. Uh, if you want to stay in a guest house with a shared bathroom, you can save a fair amount of money. That might be $100, $150, maybe about half. Um, so just be prepared when you're thinking about prices in Icelandic. It's always going to be a little bit higher. Uh, so there's two options that I just mentioned. There's hotels, traditional hotels like you have anywhere. There's a big custom for guest houses, and very often guest houses have either partly or exclusively rooms with shared bathrooms. That's the way they keep the cost down. So if you're looking at a guest house in Iceland, uh, be aware that there's very likely a non-bathroom option there, and sometimes that's the only choice you have. Uh, for this reason, the expense of accommodations, I find uh, it works really well to use Air Airbnb and maybe some other apartment rental sites of that, of that type. This allows Icelanders who own property to rent it out uh, at prices to uh, people like us, tourists, that aren't breaking the bank, but also allow those local people to make a little bit of income out of it. Uh, as a concrete example, on a recent visit to Iceland, I was in Reykjavik for quite a while, so I switched around and I went to three different Air Airbnbs, and each one was quite different. One of them was a downtown apartment right in the center of Reykjavik. 
a big spacious one bedroom apartment with a living room and a kitchen. Another one was a beautiful little um, bottom floor of a family home. Again, a big spacious one bedroom apartment uh, on the suburban part of Reykjavik facing the water, a long walk or a short drive from downtown. And then the other one was actually my own house in a little bedroom community about a half hour drive outside of Reykjavik. Each of these properties cost me about $150, $160. Okay, so that's about the cost of a guest house downtown with a shared bathroom. You can get your own house or your own apartment downtown with your own bathroom and so forth for about the same price. For that reason, I think people who are thinking about budget when they're looking at Iceland are finding that Airbnb is a great, a great choice. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Icelandic food. And of course, this is shaped by this remote location of Iceland, the hard scrabble pioneer lifestyle. Uh, unfortunately, and I think uh, sort of uh, unjustifiably, Iceland is mostly famous for its gross foods, its hardship foods, right? Uh, because when you're living on an island in the middle of nowhere and it's winter, you just need to eat something. So you have things like fish jerky. You have things like the head of a lamb that's just served right there on a plate so you can pick away at the cheek meat. And the most famous, the Greenland shark, sometimes called the rotted shark, uh, where it's just actually a little chunk of shark that's been fermented buried underground and allowed to ferment. And it kind of has a fish and ammonia flavor. It's really nice. <laughs> Icelanders who are watching this are rolling their eyes and saying they're talking about the rotted shark again. We don't ever eat rotted shark. And that's why I say this is traditional. This is old school Icelandic. I'm here to tell you today Iceland has a fantastic food scene. I consider myself something of a foodie. And I've been really impressed by the quality of the food in Iceland. You have excellent lamb in Iceland. There are aficionados who would say the best lamb you can get anywhere is in, is in Iceland because they have the countryside of rolling pastures and the lambs are grazing and there's just a certain flavor to the meat that people really say is special in Iceland. And as you might imagine, they also have great seafood in Iceland, great fish. They have great, uh, they call them lobster, but it's what we might call a langoustine, uh, kind of a smaller lobster or a very large shrimp, really delectable seafood. There's a great variety of restaurants uh, all over Iceland. You've got trendy big eating halls, you've got inviting outdoor seating, it's a very cold climate but when it's nice, everyone gets out and sits out on the sidewalk to enjoy. So I've been talking about the budgetary concerns. Iceland uh, food is also very expensive, and this is the one that could really hurt. You might think 150 bucks for an Airbnb, no big deal. To get a pretty basic sit-down restaurant dinner in Reykjavik, entrees are gonna be around $40 per person, $30, $40 a person. Um, this might sound a little backwards, but when a basic dinner costs $40, you can get a really great dinner for $50 or $60. So I find myself justifying going to nicer restaurants in Iceland. Uh, you can't get a $20 dinner unless it's groceries or a hot dog, okay? <laughs> so if you want to go to a restaurant, you might as well kind of go all out and do it great. I have a couple of favorites that we mentioned in our Rick Steves Iceland Guidebook um, that you can get a great dinner here for $50, $60, $70 dollars a person, and it's going to be a memorable dinner. Or you could pay $40 a person for a totally forgettable dinner, totally practical dinner. <laughs> now that assumes you want to go and have a nice dinner and of course, there's other alternatives as well in Iceland. My big tip here, if you want to save money and eat really well in Iceland, have your big special restaurant meal at lunch. Even the nicest restaurants in Iceland have amazing lunch specials. They have a fish of the day, usually for $25, $30. Now, that sounds like a lot for lunch, um, but again, your alternative is a $15 hot dog. It's not that tough to spend $25 on a plate of food like this. Uh, have your big meal at lunch, and then you can do something a little more basic for dinner you can go to get some groceries and, and have a picnic. Uh, you can order a pizza, that sort of thing, which would be more in the $20, $20 range if you wanted to order a pizza. Um, so that's my favorite budget tip for eating affordably in Iceland. Also, especially, again, at lunchtime, you look for soup and bread buffets. This is a custom all over Iceland in the city, also throughout the countryside. Bakeries and cafes will have an all-you-can-eat soup buffet with all the bread you can eat and all the water you can drink and all the coffee you can drink, usually for $15 or $20 which again, sounds like a lot for lunch, but you can fill up, you can have six bowls of soup, and then you can, <laughs> then you can graze on vegetables for dinner if you want. Um, again, this is a good budget tip. Look for the, the unlimited soup and bread buffet at lunchtime. Uh, one other thing about Iceland food I feel like I have to talk about. Icelandic food is newly trendy here in the United States. This is skir, which is sort of uh, similar to like a, a Greek yogurt, um, but has a very long tradition in Iceland. It's an interesting uh, way that Iceland and, and, and sort of the, some of the foods that are popular in Iceland are starting to spread out and become popular here stateside as well. It's, it's one more way in which the world is becoming more aware of Iceland. Uh, Iceland also has a, a good drinking culture. They've got a really good microbrew culture. So if you like to go to a microbrewery and taste what people are doing locally in terms of interesting brews, 
Uh, that's really a trendy thing right now in all over Iceland, but especially in Reykjavik. Alcohol prices, of course, are very, very high. Uh, one tip if you want to stock up on some booze before your trip to Iceland, you buy it at the duty-free store when you arrive at the airport. It's cheaper than anywhere else in the country. Uh, my other tip for this is there's some really fun bars. If you want to go out for a drink, of course, that's, that's a must. Some really fun bars with uh, microbrews and with cocktails in Reykjavik, but bars tend to have a really good happy hour. So if you're willing to go a little bit earlier, sometimes they cut the price even in half. If you go to this bar and get this a uh, really nice glass of Icelandic microbrew. In the evening, later on, it might cost you $15 or $20. If you go for happy hour, it might be $10 or $12. Okay, so that's a good tip for saving money while still enjoying Icelandic drinks. Because of Iceland's unique landscape and unique terrain, you have to take certain things into consideration when you're making an itinerary. And the first thing you have to think about, do you want to go in the summer or the winter? And there's a huge difference between Iceland in the summer and Iceland in the winter. This, of course, is the land of the midnight sun. It's at about the latitude of Fairbanks, Alaska. I took this picture at 11.30 at night in early June. The sun technically sets, but it doesn't set for very long. It's two or three hours, and it never really gets dark. I happen to love this because I love to pack as much sightseeing as possible into a day. I love going in the summer because you could spend a whole day sightseeing around Reykjavik and around 4 in the afternoon get in your car, drive deep into the countryside, and have an eight-hour road trip and come back to Reykjavik exhausted, but it's still light outside. Uh, and especially because so many people are going to Iceland for just a day or two, go in the summer if you want to really make the most of your daylight hours. You can go to Iceland in the winter. In fact, the Icelandic Tourist Board is trying to promote winter travel because the summer is getting crowded. And by the way, when I say summer, I'm talking July and August. Iceland has a very short summer season because of its northern latitudes. It starts getting quite cold in September, uh, and even in early June it can be quite frigid. It's not exactly warm in July and August, but that has your highest chance of having a little bit better weather. Uh, meanwhile, Iceland has a very long winter, and the days are as short in the winter as they are long in the summer. The reason why people consider going to Iceland in the winter is because they want to see the northern lights, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't want to be a total cynic or a skeptic about this. I think it's great if you want to see the northern lights, but keep in mind you're making a lot of other trade-offs in order to see it. For one thing, you can never be guaranteed of seeing the northern lights. It can be very cloudy in Iceland. You could be there for days, and it just never clears enough that you can see them. Second of all, any picture you see like this of the northern lights these bright, vivid, glowing, sort of swirling patterns in the sky, was taken with a very special camera and was later manipulated. And when you go on your Northern Lights trip <laughs> in December, you're going to get a picture like this. <laughs> it's still impressive. And the Northern Lights are still a sort of a majestic, amazing phenomenon. Uh, however, it's not necessarily going to look like this. The other thing I want to point out in this picture, what do you notice in this picture? Icy roads. So if you go in the wintertime, you have a few hours of daylight. The sun rises in December at around 11, 11.30. It sets around 3.30. Um, so you have very limited daylight, and the roads may be covered with snow and ice. If you're going in the winter, don't try to get ambitious and go way into the countryside. You're going to have to probably stick closer to Reykjavik. Uh, but again, that said, if you really want to see the northern lights, that's the only chance you're going to get to see them. The sun never sets in the summer, so you will never see the northern lights in the summer. Okay, so don't, don't, don't go in July thinking, well, maybe we'll catch a look at the northern lights. Regardless of when you go to Iceland, <laughs> be prepared for cold weather. This is a billboard for uh, an Icelandic, kind of Iceland's version of REI, an Icelandic outfitter uh, for the outdoors. And their slogan is, waiting for summer since 1926. <laughs> in July and August, you see people in parkas and winter hats and gloves. Um, don't worry about bringing a special winter coat in the summer, but be, bring plenty of layers. If you have a lightweight hat or lightweight gloves, bring them. You might have beautiful sunshine, and it might actually crack 60 degrees on some days. Um, on other days, there could be howling wind. In fact, uh, my Icelandic friend Ian told me that Icelanders don't consider good weather sun. They consider good weather not windy. It's really the wind when you're on this island nation in the North Atlantic. The wind howling through is what's really frigid. Um, so just be prepared for uh, chilly temperatures, even if you're going in the peak of summer. In terms of your specific itinerary, I want to give you a few ways of looking at how you plan your time in Iceland, depending on if you're going short or a little bit longer. A lot of people are going to Iceland on a very quick layover. People are going to Iceland for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. And I would say if that's all you have for Iceland, make the most of it. I wouldn't discourage you from doing that. It's really worth attempting it. But you want to be really well organized and prioritize things smartly. For a very short layover of one to three days, Here's the kind of revolutionary tip. Don't spend a lot of time in Reykjavik. Spend the night in Reykjavik. It's a fantastic home base. It's got great restaurants, great nightlife. If you're there in summer, 
it's light out all the time anyway, so you can come back from a busy day of sightseeing at 10 p.m. and still be able to go for a nice sunny stroll outside. Uh, spend the night in Reykjavik, but you're in Iceland not necessarily for Reykjavik. You're in Iceland for the natural wonders of the countryside. So if I had one day in Iceland, I would, let's say, for example, arrive in the morning. I would go to the Blue Lagoon, which is the famous spa. On the way from the airport into Reykjavik, I would have lunch in Reykjavik. I might spend a couple hours poking around, but mid-afternoon, if it's summer and it's light, I would get in my car and spend several hours driving into the countryside, collapse back at my Reykjavik hotel at midnight, get a few hours sleep, wake up, go to the airport, and fly to my next destination. If that's all you have 24 hours, that's a great way to spend it, and you'll get a nice variety of sites. If you have a little more time, you can add more day trips. I'll talk a little later about the specifics. Favorite side trips are the Blue Lagoon, the Golden Circle, and the South Coast. If you're going for two days, pick two of them. If you're going for three days, pick all three. And again, I'll talk a little later about some of the details of how this works. Reykjavik's here. Blue Lagoon's 45 minutes away. Golden Circle is in the countryside to the east. South Coast is down here. On a short visit, I would basically combine the Blue Lagoon with your airport arrival or departure, spend some time on the Golden Circle. It takes about a day. Spend some time on the South Coast. It takes about a day. If you have a little bit more time, four, six, seven, eight days, you can have time for all of those side trips. You can add more side trips. There's a great spot I love called the Westman Islands. If you had a fourth day, that's what I would spend my time on, the Westman Islands. Then you have more time for hanging out around Reykjavik. Okay, so if you've got five or six days, I would devote at least a good day of sightseeing in Reykjavik. Maybe do a whale watching trip, maybe take an excursion into the countryside for some adventure sports, hiking across a glacier, that sort of thing. If you have more time, if you have at least nine days, now we're really talking. Now we're talking about the ultimate Icelandic road trip, which is the Ring Road. The Ring Road is a road that goes all the way around Iceland and lets you see all of the dramatic landscapes in the distant corners of this country. You don't want to attempt the Ring Road if you have less than about seven days or eight days, let's say. Um, so if you're just going for three or four days, don't try to squeeze it in, because once you start halfway around, you really have to go all the rest of the way around. Uh, it's not something that should be rushed. This is for somebody who's not just doing a quick layover. This is for somebody who really wants to see Iceland. At the end of this talk, I'll narrate what you would see if you did the whole ring road trip. By the way, if you are just going to Reykjavik for a day or two, uh, one of my colleagues, Kevin Williams, did a class like this one covering the highlights of Reykjavik. So he offers sort of a different perspective and a really bit more of a focus on, on Reykjavik specifically uh, than this talk has. So I, I encourage you to check that one out. Now that we've talked about what we're doing in Iceland, let's talk about how we're going to get there. Um, the short answer to this is you probably want to rent a car. Uh, and the reason for that is you might think, well, it'd be cheaper to take public transportation. If you're only going to Reykjavik and the Blue Lagoon, public transportation is fine. It's easy to get a transfer from the airport to the Blue Lagoon, from the Blue Lagoon downtown, and from downtown back to the airport. But if you want to get out into these spectacular bits of countryside, the Golden Circle, the South Coast, there is no public transportation that really connects that you're going to have to pay for an excursion. Okay? And an excursion can cost $100, $150, $200 dollars per person per excursion. When you start adding up those costs pretty quickly, it becomes affordable to rent a car in Iceland. When you might not have thought for two days, of course we're not going to rent a car. We're only there for two days. Well, if you're spending one of those days at the Golden Circle, one of those days at the South Coast, a car rental split between two people is less expensive than the total of four excursions, two excursions for two people each, if you follow my logic here. Um, so really think carefully about driving in Iceland. And I would say Iceland's a relatively easy place to drive. One important thing to think about when you imagine renting a car in Iceland, especially with some of the pictures I'll show you, you might think you need some sort of a monster truck, a 4x4 Jeep, right, to get to this landscape. Everything I'm going to describe in this class, everything in the best two weeks Iceland has to offer can be done in a tiny little car like this. Um, there are a few gravel roads where you're going to have to slow down and be a little careful steering and some unique challenges of driving in Iceland. But all of the roads in the summer are passable by a basic two-wheel drive car. So don't invest in a big 4x4 unless you are really doing some hiking and camping and getting way off the beaten track into the highlands of Iceland. So that's my summary of what I think every traveler needs to know logistically in terms of skills, sleeping, eating, transportation when they're going to Iceland and how to make an itinerary. Mm -hmm.